Hey folks, welcome back. This is Andy with the Poor Pearls Almanac. Today we're talking with Tommy Fenster, a PhD student with UC Davis and the Ecdysis Foundation. Tommy works primarily with quantifying agroecological and regenerative farming approaches, specifically around California's perennial cropping systems. In this episode, we're talking about almond farms, and not just almond farms, but almond farms in California. There's a lot of conversation around whether or not these systems are sustainable, and Tommy's work is primarily focused on looking at what people are doing and how regenerative farming can or can't help solve some of the problems that we see specifically around water management. To check out Tommy's work, go follow the links we've provided in the show notes and enjoy the episode. Tommy, thanks so much for coming on. Could you tell our audience a little bit about yourself? Hello, well, thank you for having me. Um, yeah, I am right now a PhD student at UC Davis in the Horticulture and Agronomy program and Dr. Amelie Godin's Agroecology Lab. And sort of a unique partnership as well because I'm also a part of the Ecdysis Foundation, which is a regenerative research organization uh, led by Dr. John Lundgren based out in Esteline, South Dakota. So essentially I have Dr. Godin and Dr. Lundgren are my sort of advisors for my, my PhD. And I just wrapped up a master's in biology last May at Cal State East Bay with Dr. Patty Okawa and, and John Lundgren again. And in that work, I uh, looked at um, regenerative management in, in almonds or almond systems. Um, and now I'll be focusing on uh, vineyard systems for my, my PhD work. I'm still doing a little bit of stuff in the almonds. Awesome. So yeah, those are up my alley, both of them. I like wine and I like, you know, nut trees. Excellent. So <laughs> so yeah, you're, you're definitely doing the work I want to know about. So first, can we talk a little bit about what you're doing specifically around these almond trees? Like what were you guys looking at? Yeah, definitely. So um, we're kind of curious about, you know, what is the efficacy of regenerative management in almond orchards out here in California? Um, I'm not sure how many of you have gotten a chance to maybe drive up the five. Have you ever got a chance to drive the five, Andy, at all or out here? Yeah. Okay, so um, the five or the 99, um, they sort of span our California Central Valley. And if you, if you do ever have the chance to grow up, you'll notice um, you still see pretty much uh, a ton of almond orchards all along the side of the road. Uh, but, you know, these are management, managed in a very uh, conventional manage. So, you know, they are chemically mowed with herbicide applications extensively. So bare or orchard floors, um, you know, for much of the year. As a result, you know, there's issues with erosion and carbon loss and a lot of, a lot of dust and other stuff that comes up. Um, also, as a result, you know, very pretty reliant on other types of synthetics as well. You know, there's not much in an ecosystem to potentially provide ecosystem services like fertility, water infiltration, um, and whatnot. So, you know, these are managed really conventionally, a lot of synthetic inputs. And, you know, we're wondering, you know, there are growers out there who are doing a bit differently. You know, they're getting cover crops out there using organic amendments, you know, taking this regenerative approach. Some of them are even bringing in grazers, um, avoiding disturbances of that orchard floor, planting hedgers, and you're saying, you know, there are these producers, they're definitely the minority um, by far. I think, you know, maybe about 1% of all almonds in California are organic, if that, I think even less than that, 1%, and uh, of that, you know, even less of them would be considered regenerative. So, you know, let's see, let's go out to these minority, these regenerative producers and compare how they match up with their conventional counterparts. And our approach is taking a full systems approach. So looking at everything from soil quality due to the biological communities to the, um, the economics, which is yield and, and, and profitability. And then also within that, you know, we're curious about, you know, what are, what are the interactions, you know, you know, if there is similar pest damage, is there increased biodiversity maybe correlating to reduce pest damage or how is this biological community, such as the invertebrates microbial communities attracting to influence soil quality? You know, that, that reminds me around here, we have a lot of apple orchards, and those apple orchards tend to uh, spray as well chemicals, so they don't have to mow and things like that. Uh, despite the fact that it's like New England and people think like the, this, like have this image of like what an apple orchard looks like, it usually doesn't look anything like that here, uh, where they're basically uh, espaliered uh, across, you know, massive tracks that are sprayed down and there's grass in between, but like underneath the trees is just dead. Right. And uh, it's, you know, it's unfortunate, but the image versus the reality are very different. 
so like what what's the, the reason i mean you're not you know like water is not much of an issue for y'all i guess so you're not like is it the why are they spraying so extensively underneath this is pesticides probably uh is my imagine is what i would imagine uh and then you know there's this whole question of, and this is something you probably have uh, experience too in the research you're doing is around the regulatory aspects of grazing animals through uh, fruit fields. Yeah, definitely. I know for, you know, almonds, it's the, the tricky part of that is, you know, they're harvested off the orchard floor, but apples, you know, it, I, like you're picking them right off the tree. Sorry, my ignorance. <laughs> but, um, sure. Yeah. It has to do with the, the distance in the, like an animal can't be around a tree crop for a certain period of time. So you can technically graze uh, like a silvopasture type system, but you know you have to time it appropriately. And for a lot of people that already don't want to do it, or they're like, "Yeah, I'd do it if it's easy to do and saves me money." Now you're adding like this big wrench into it that they're like, "Yeah, you know, I'll just keep spraying." No, yeah, totally. Um, yeah, it's hard. I know, like, yeah, I know for the almonds, so the grazers who do do it, they have to get them out 120 days, you know, before um, harvest. And in California, that's not too much of an issue because our summers are so dry that you know the amount of forage that is available um maybe not so much of an issue um there is yeah anyways yeah but, um, 120 days here is like a lot of hay yeah that's a lot <laughs> that's, of a lot. that's a lot yeah, I mean, yeah. You're, it seems like that'd be the, the perfect system yeah so you know kind of this research on this stuff too is you know that's sort of a, a regulatory burden and some of our research you know kind of hopes to address that right you know um, but we're not, we are going to be doing research actually in apple orchards up in Washington, Oregon, led by uh, my colleague, Matt Jones, who's an ecdysis research scientist up there, but looking into some of this, this food safety aspects, you know, you know, looking at, is this really a food safety concern um, for consumers to bring grazers into these type of systems? And, you know, so we're going to try to look at some of these questions. So maybe, you know, some of these regulations you know, maybe in, in, in certain forms of them, they're a little bit overly restrictive and kind of impeding the ability of farmers to integrate some of these practices. So I think when it comes to almonds, people have a certain understanding of like, okay, almonds in California are super destructive to the environment because they need so much water. Like, I think that's something we see fairly frequently in various like circles around like sustainable agriculture and things like that. I don't know if you could talk a little bit about kind of what you guys see and like how accurate that portrayal is in terms of almonds. Yeah. I mean, I think overall, you know, almonds are sort of the poster child for uh, somewhat of the fundamental new thinking that's happening around agriculture out here in California and you know where it is. So there is, um, in the Central Valley, we have about uh, 7 million acres under production. Um, I think we're up to almost 1.7 million acres of that being almonds themselves. So they are a, a major force and a major factor. Also, what you've seen with the massive drought that we're in in California is that water is getting more expensive. There's less surface water available, so you're pumping. Or if you're a farmer down south, you're paying rice farmers up north for their water to get it to it. So... Um, what you're also seeing is it's also driving farmers to planting higher value perennial crops. So it's actually, in some ways, um, the drought is creating uh, somewhat of a perverse economic incentive for the planting of higher value crops so farmers can make more money off the limited water that they do have available. So overall, what the point is, is that um, in California, we have expanded our agricultural footprint to such an extent that we do not have enough surface water for that agriculture. Um, for example, I think, you know, there's going to be, uh, from the Central Valley Project, it's going to be 0% allotments to farmers this year. And that's the water that, the snowpack that we trap at the reservoirs and, and send out to the valley. So 0% of that's going to get distributed this year. I think that's the same last year, and previous years as well, too. So there's not enough water. And then so farmers are, are pumping a lot of, of groundwater, but the pumping of groundwater isn't sustainable. Um, wells are going dry all out along to the, the Central Valley. And almonds are sort of the, the poster child of these crops. And I think that the, the point is, is there are ways, I think, you know, of, of making our farming practices maybe more regenerative, more sustainable, in which, you know, potentially we're building up that soil quality, having to pull off moisture, getting more infiltration, you know, potentially maybe some more recharge and whatnot there. But essentially the point is, is that we have expanded to also growing crops on land in which the soil is not ideal it can be alkaline and in which our groundwater itself that we're using is actually really fairly salty so i think really 
overall, the estimates are that California may potentially have to repurpose fallow um, up to 700,000 to 2 million of the, those acres that are in production. So I think, you know, um, that's really kind of the big conundrum that we're facing. I think we do need to work to make these orchards more regenerative, more sustainable, but it's also thinking about over this this large landscape and really rethinking, you know, how are we using some of this land? I mean, right now, I know, let's see, California just proposed the Multi-Benefits Land Repurposing Act, effective July 2020, to convert farmland to native habitats, recharge basins, and less water-intensive farming. You have things like the CRP, Conservation Reserve Program. So I think you're going to see, especially with in California, we have this Sustainable Groundwater Management Act. We've not been regulating groundwater at all up until uh, we got passed. But it doesn't really have any teeth until about, I think about 10 to 20 years out from now. But this is going to regulate the amount of pumping. So uh, with our limited surface water, you're going to see our farmland really sort of shifting. I know that it's kind of a... <laughs> yeah, I mean, it points to the fact that the, the almond isn't really the problem. It's just the one that's been, like, targeted because it's grown so quickly because it's such a high-value uh, crop. Uh, and, you know, I, I look at, like, pictures, and, of course, being there versus, uh, like, seeing a picture on the Internet are very different. But it seems like, from what I've seen, that the management practices are actually, like, fairly in line with what the what the ecology would naturally want like it, it's obviously too dense but if you look like again i'll i'll pick on like apple orchards here you know usually if you're at an apple orchard in the u.s the trees are or uh, in the northeast at least um the trees are like a couple feet apart and very tightly trimmed and like that way machines can come through and like harvest fairly quickly like basically a like monocrop rows in the pictures i've seen of like almond orchards it's very similar to like a dehesa style, like very large canopies. The trees set decently apart, probably should be a little bit further apart based on like the dryness of the area and the, the moisture content in the soil. But like considering that they have very similar qualities in these regions, it doesn't seem like it's necessarily done like completely in abandonment of the ecological needs and i don't know if you could speak a little further on that yeah you know that, that's, that's kind of interesting that yeah, to think about how much even more <laughs> away from a, a, natural, a somewhat natural system it, it could get and uh, it is funny i did just hear of a farm putting in an almond orchard um how you uh, describe um, what sort of that espelier um system so it, it could very well be coming to california too so yeah how you describe the trees themselves being being planted and allowed to get, you know, fairly full canopies. You know, they are they are pruned. You may have some hedging and topping operation for different machines coming through at these much larger farms, just kind of giving your basic kind of buzz cuts um, around and along the top. But um, I would say, though, the understory is not natural, really, what whatsoever. Um, because to of these, the spraying? Yeah, to the, to the spraying. You see these really um, sort of barren areas, and a lot of time, you know, um, you know, there may be, there's a lot of times there's bare soil all throughout the winter. So that's when we get our rains out here in California. We don't need to get much when we get rain out here. I think, you know, even if we get sometimes up to, you know, just like two inches of rain, you'll see ponding and flooding out in sort of these orchards when you drive. And that's, you know, that, that, that shouldn't be happening. You know, these, these, yeah. um, we got to be able to take that rain and have, have ground cover and the root systems and, and take it and yeah. infiltrate it back down to the soil. We got to, um, when we have that, um, that ground cover and that diversity of those hedgerows, we get, you know, we get that, that greater biodiversity. So it's harder for any pests to one, you know, find the almond tree. And then there's also more stuff in there to eat them. And it's this more complex ecosystem. Also helps our pollinations as well. Pollinator, um, almonds are reliant on pollinators. So we bring out honeybees um, to get, um, to come out and pollinate the orchards. And, you know, we want to try to support those, you know, bees need to eat a little bit more of a complex diet other than just, <laughs> the resources from the almonds themselves so we can support them and get a better fruit set by having flower and cover crops during the time of sure. bloom too. And then it's also in terms of, you know, let's think about the stress as we go in through the summer. We have that bare orchard floor um, and it's just reflecting that heat back up into the canopy. And I, I know I have a advisor here at um, Davis and said, you know, during these, these heat waves that we had, the big damage to the grapes was during these heat waves and it was the heat reflecting 
off of the floor of the vineyard and going back up and it's like creating a lot more stress you know for the trees and themselves themselves too and um yeah so i think there's a lot you know we could um, kind of do with regards to our management of almond orchards to create make them into stronger ecosystems so that we can get um, the delivery of these ecosystems ecosystem services in them yeah and i think what this points to is the fact that like you know it, it's i don't want to say easy to put down cover crops underneath the trees but it's much easier to do that than to like take a super dense planting and like reorganize these like massive trees that are already in the ground the point i wanted to make is the almond farms that exist today it's not like they need to necessarily just be like cut down and started over like there there's some pretty good infrastructure there to work with and it's not like this thing that needs to be tossed aside. No, I think I think you're I think you're totally I think you're totally correct. Um, yes, you, someone to start moving towards a more regenerative or agroecologically intensive management does not need to rip out the orchard. They could very well, you know, make, make a game plan and be, be starting implementing these practices um, after harvest this fall. You know, let's you know that we could be sitting down right now and coming up and thinking about our cover crop mix, you know, what kind of compost do we want to get in here? What kind of sprays can we cut back down on? Yeah. I think this all frames up kind of where your research starts digging in. So could you talk a little bit about what you guys did around uh, comparing some of the regenerative farmers versus the traditional orchards that you were looking at? Definitely. So I think there's kind of, kind of walk, yeah, walk up through the, um, the metrics. So we'll start with soil and make our way up to sort of the, the people element. Um, so with soil, we looked at total soil carbon and nitrogen down to about two feet, um, broken into um, six increments um, going down to that two feet. We looked at um, in the top six inches of the soil. We looked at all the soil macro and micronutrients, as well as some of these faster cycling forms of nitrogen and carbon, sort of an indicator of you know, how much food is available for the microbes, how quickly are the microbes turning organic form of nitrogen into plant available forms of nitrogen. Then we looked at the microbial community itself in the top four inches, top 10 centimeters. You, we use um, phospholipid fatty acid uh, analysis uh, for that. And it gives you a basic overview of what the living microbial community is at the, the time of sampling. Um, and then we went up and we looked at the plant community. So we looked at you know, what percentage of the orchard floor is covered in plants? And then we looked at the, the plant species richness, um, you know, because the ground cover itself is a great indicator of um, for erosion potential as well. Um, and then moving up, we looked at the, um, we looked at the invertebrates, the, the bugs and the worms. And for that, we placed down a, a quadrat. So a half meter by a half meter square metal walls that are about six inches. You put it into the ground and then you suck up you kind of dig around the soil and you suck up anything that's in that in that quadrat. And we went out and we sampled for those that bloom in the middle of the growing season fruiting, and then again at harvest. And then um, moving up through management, we used grower surveys to quantify all the amount of inputs that were used. And we did a basic balance sheet of, of yield and, and profitability. And, you know, what we found is that these regenerative orchards perform, you know, pretty much kind of outperform the conventional counterparts in these soil quality, biological community um, metrics, as well as, um, as well as profitability. So they had about 30% more soil carbon going down to that the two feet. They generally had more higher levels of macro micronutrients, so they had significantly actually more nitrogen in the soil. Both of them had nice carbon and nitrogen ratios. Uh, you know, right around, both of them are right around that, you know, that 10 to 1 mark. So indicating, you know, they're both kind of in that prime area for cycling nutrients. So, you know, making that, knowing that, you know, that these regenerative orchards are, you know, turning, getting these organic nitrogen, turning it into uh, more, more plant available forms. Yeah, so larger microbial communities, um, and then much larger and more diverse um, invertebrate communities that we found in there. In terms of ground coverage, and a lot more ground cover and species plant diversity on their orchard floor um, the faster water infiltration rates so about six times it took the water infiltrated the soil in the regenerative orchard six times that of their their conventional counterparts and we found similar levels of pest damage between the two the two systems so no no difference uh, between them but we've actually found a significant correlation between increasing 
bio invertebrate biodiversity and reduce pest damage. So suggesting that sort of the the mechanisms which these two systems went to getting those similar levels of pest damage were different. You know, with the conventional ones, it was lots of pesticide sprays, but with the much larger, more diverse plant and invertebrate communities, it kind of looked like that these regenerative orchards were, um, you know, getting provided ecosystem service through the biodiversity of the system um, for pest control. And then moving up with regards to regards to the yields and profitability. So the yields between the two systems were statistically similar. I think the, the average yields of the, the conventional orchards were, were as higher, but our p-value, so our level of significance for that was 0.17. You know, traditionally your p-value is going to be 0.05. Um, so, you know, there was like a, a trend towards higher yields in conventional orchards, but statistically they were pretty similar. I mean, we actually saw some variability. So there are some regenerative, but kind of, through it for a loop, you know, there were some regenerative orchards that were kind of hitting up into those conventional level yields. So while, you know, there was maybe a, a slight trend, a pattern towards higher yields in the conventional orchards, it was not, it was not significant. And it, it kind of shows that, you know, these regenerative orchard systems, you know, have the potential to potentially thrive at a, a level similar to conventional counterparts. If you look at all the soil metrics, you know, these regenerative orchards had actually a little bit higher levels of N, better micronutrients, better microbial communities. Um, and there, there's been other research around, too, about sort of this. So that was sort of a very encouraging aspect. In regards to the profitability, they had, the two systems had similar costs to them. Though it looked like, if you look at the, the data, that, um, again, greater variability, especially on the lower end for the general workers. So it looked like, you know, there's maybe more room to drop costs in their general systems. Conventional systems, the costs, they were, everyone, they were all exactly the same. You know, there is, you look at our little box and whisker plot, you can't even see the whiskers. Yes, they're buying the same products for the same exact needs. Yeah, and, yeah. and it, it sh yep. totally shows that regenerative systems aren't dialed in. Yeah. Completely. You know, there's room to, that's why research needs to, a lot of all the extension research work goes to, you know, helping these conventional systems. So I see a lot of research and extension that goes into regenerative farmers is, is way less, you know, but I think um, it, it speaks to that. But um, the regenerative orchards have higher profitability because they're getting a, a greater premium for the product. They're getting organic premium and then some are also direct selling to consumers, so getting an additional premium on top of that. Hey there, it's Andy from the Pork Rolls Almanac. Thank you so much for taking the time to listen to our podcast. As you can probably tell, this content involves extensive research and editing to release weekly episodes. If you think this content is valuable for the future that we inherit, please consider financially supporting this project by visiting poorproles.com and clicking on the Patreon, Venmo, Ko-Fi, or PayPal tabs. Every dollar helps offset our costs for hosting the podcast content and helps offset hundreds of hours of work put towards this project monthly. Thank you for supporting us by sharing, liking, and donating to this project. Together, we can build a better future. This brings up a couple questions for me as I like listen to data. I'm always curious, like we're talking about regenerative farmers. These all didn't start as regenerative farms at the same time. So I'm wondering if you guys saw that difference, whereas like newer regenerative farms had lower lower amounts of whatever, you know, each of those statistics that you brought up, uh, whether it's yield or uh, costs or things like that. Yeah, so by having orchards sort of along a range of management, so we were able to look at the association. What we did was we looked at the association of soil carbon to years under these different types of management. And what we actually found was a significant relationship between the years under regenerative management and increasing soil carbon and years under conventional management and decreasing soil carbon. So that was actually really, uh, really interesting from our standpoint. It looks like, you know, very roughly, if we look at sort of, um, you know, we did a sort of a linear type model. Um, that's how we looked at this. So if you look at the, the slope of that line, it indicates that the regenerative orchards are, you know, gaining maybe about half a metric ton of carbon per year, while the conventional orchards are losing about half a metric ton of carbon per year. And that's sort of, if you look at the other literature around gains and losses in carbon, it, it, that seems to be a pretty reasonable estimate. You know, this is... You know, more work research has done actually tracking it over the years instead of looking at the relationship to the years under the management. But um, that's what we did look at in terms of, um, I mean, we could have, I think we, there's, 
there's still more room to probably play around with some of the data and those relationships we saw. But um, with the whole out here in California, we have this, um, the California cap and trade and the, the idea of soil carbon out here. And uh, so that's the sort of, that we kind of dove in specifically on that relationship. Yeah. Yeah. My other question that I think might have some interesting uh, evidence come out of it is, you know, I think about like a regenerative farm, like in a sea of like traditional farms. And it's like, okay, you've created this island of diversity. And I'm curious to know if there was any like correlation between how big that island was compared to like how healthy and diverse it was. Like, is there, a, it, does it make a difference? And if, if so, how small can it be before it's kind of meaningless, if that makes sense? No, that's a big, that's a great question. So you're, you're yeah, you're, you're, we're delving now into like the, the farm and the landscape level. Of yeah, like it, because like all those things, you know, if we're talking about like biodiversity and resilience, mm -hmm. then like the the scope of complexity is going to impact the ability of that farm to take advantage of those benefits. Yeah, exactly. And I, I think I think both on, on farm. So in this study, I will say we, we did not look at the impact of the overall landscape level of diversity. So, you know, what was the diversity of that landscape? You know, 500 meters out from the sampling point, sure. uh, 1,000, 5,000. But it is a lot of uh, research does show that that is really important that that commits, you know, not only is what you're doing on the farm, but what's happening in the overall landscape is, is really critical to delivery of ecosystem services um, from pollinate, especially for pollinators who are, you know, yeah. really pretty mobile and, and moving around. Um, and I think that's something yeah. I'd like to explore more in the future um, research. Yeah, I mean, you think about like pesticide spray, like it can drift pretty far. So, you know, working on a, a, t a 10 acre farm versus a 5,000 acre farm is going to give you a lot of that buffer from like that overlap and things like that. And I, I didn't really expect you to have an answer, but I was kind of hoping you would. Yeah. <laughs> because it would be nice to know. Yeah, I think really it's sort of, yeah, it's, it's super, I can speak, you know, to some of our, you know, farms, they were literally, you know, across the road from each other, you know, like 10 yards, there's like just the road driving through, you know, the middle. We had our general on one side, but on one side, it just even on one side of the road from each other, you know, the, the differences in biodiversity and ecosystem service are really, really vast. So there definitely are farm level effects that occur. But um, yeah, there's been a lot of great research out here in California looking at greater, you know, more complex, diverse landscapes and that correlate to an increase, you know, increase and improve pollination rates and the importance of integrating like semi-natural habitat into the landscape. And I know some some of the other, I think believe maybe all of orchards like Parade Days, who I looked at, like, yeah, more complex landscapes having lower incidences of pest outbreaks, greater pest control as well. Um, so, yeah, it plays. And I think as we're, you know, kind of going back, as we're rethinking, you know, how we may have to rethink how we're using some of this land in California, how can we maybe optimize that to plan it out so that we can be making our landscape, you know, kind of more diverse and kind of going around these farms to enhance that delivery of those services to the farms themselves. So um, not just having um, all of a sudden be like, oh, shit, we're out of water, like just fallow whatever acres or the only, we're only, you know, the acres are going to be fallow or the farmers who can't pay this new cost for water, but try to be really targeted and, and strategic about it so we can kind of work with some of those things that you're speaking about. Yeah, I mean, I think that speaks to the inherent discrepancy between like our economic model of like private ownership of land and like having the right to do whatever you want with that land yeah. versus the, the natural needs of those ecosystem in terms of like you're saying, ecosystem services. And even when we say like, okay, the land, we're having a water shortage, we need to think about like letting lands go fallow. But I mean, it's better in a lot of cases, but that's not necessarily like how those lands have been managed in the past either. So that's not really the best solution many times as well. Yeah, definitely. You know, I would say Fallon, you know, thinking like, yeah, reworking to, you know, restoring around like sort of a traditional flood zone so that you you can allow in heavy years for the water to naturally go over the, oh, they could use riparian restorations and also recharge the groundwater, you know. And maybe some cases it's going back to more, more grazing or sort of dry land dry land farming yeah yeah exactly it's um, yeah, and that comes with like a whole host of like educational requirements for people that live in those areas and manage those landscapes so I, i'm kind of curious uh if you have any thoughts about i i know you don't do as much work with almonds anymore and that you've kind of transitioned a little bit 
But, you know, in terms of like somebody that's spent a lot of time researching and working in this area, given climate change, do you have any thoughts about like what we know now that we should be doing? I, I think you've kind of answered it, but I, I'm curious if you have uh, more thoughts that are outside of the scope of the research you've done, at least in this paper. Yeah, climate change is going to have significant impacts on California ag. It's making less less surface water available, so we're getting less, less snow up into the mountains. And the future predictions, instead of snow, it's probably going to be rain. And the beautiful thing about snow is that, you know, it's up there, we store it over the winter, and then it kind of melts, and we can, time of the reservoir, when it rains, it just sort of it shoots off. Man, we can't really capture it, we can't redirect it to our ag. So that's a really big, uh, really big issue with climate change. We're gonna, probably going to be working with less surface water. When it does rain, we're going to have these more, it's going to be more sporadic. It looks like these more intense events. We really got to make sure we're, we're capturing it on site, not letting it run off. Um, the other thing that's kind of really big sort of with climate change is it's this variability that brings in. So um, a big issue is it's frost. So, you know, we may have um, sort of the big issue in some ways probably already seeing is that, you know, you may have a, a bit, as you just kind of mentioned, these weird, as you're seeing in the beginning show or before we were talking. I think it was before we were recording. Before yeah. we were recording, uh, the sort of the weirdness you saw with your, your maple trees. So a similar thing. So maybe you have a really warm time in late January and the trees, they go into an early bloom, but then you have a, then you have a frost again in, in you know, early mid February and it just sort of wipes out Writes out that crop, and I think that's sort of a really big issue with climate change that we're going to potentially be seeing is sort of like this, uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, this undulating like temperature swing and yeah. undulating. Then, then, then the stress themselves, you know, heat stress. You know, trees are very much you know like us in humans. You know, we have if you're out and it's it's too hot, you know, you start stuff starts to start stuff starts to break down, and you know, you start sucking for water there's not water there you, know, you can develop embolism <laughs> like it's all like you know the physiology of, a, of where we are we are different but you know you just you know think about if you're going to go out and go for a run um and perform you know <laughs> doing it in like a on an 80 degree day or a 110 degree day the amount of water that you're given <laughs> to then do that run it's going to really affect your really affect your performance um that's that's another sort of big worry and, and there, there's things, you know, we can look to try to, you know, adapt a little bit. You know, we have, we can exploit, there's the whole, we, we got to think about the whole frame. So I like to think about it as this kind of the standard equation. And it's looking at it with regards to the, the genotype. So how can we adapt sort of the breeding of our plant species to be better adapted? You know, this is going to be looking at, you know, more of those native or wild relatives. How can we look at sort of the environment? So kind of looking at, you know, kind of that landscape scale as you're thinking, how can we kind of reimagine our landscapes to kind of, you know, work better together and kind of meet these tangents? And the third is management. So what can we do at that arm on farm level? And then the fourth is really a society, right? There's these sort of like we kind of have to, you know, there's these different subsidies or incentives in our society as we exist. And we need to kind of look at all four of them that make solutions along sort of all four elements of that equation being genotype environment management and society there's no easy solution and that's something like uh, for us uh, with the podcast people will be like oh with climate change where should i move and it's like that's not really there's places you don't want to be but there's really no place you want to be because there's so many different pieces that play into it the the undulations of the weather the willingness of that community or that society where you want to go theoretically to make the the necessary adjustments, whether that's through foodways or land management practices, uh, all these different things. It, it's a really complex web or matrix of decision makers in a, a bunch of different layers that will really impact what the future looks like. And as easy as it is to just blame like structural issues, parts of it are also still individual as well. Definitely, yeah, and it gets, it gets overwhelming. Uh, <laughs> Absolutely. Out of cycle, but I think we have to kind of think, you know, it's, it's kind of like a team, right? You know, my research is a little bit more on the farm, you know, the, the farm-based management. I get overwhelmed, like, think about these policy and structural issues. We kind of have to think, you know, we got to collaborate, you know, you just kind of do your little small part and try to talk and collaborate with other people who are doing their big and small part and try to move these 
as a collective try to move these different levers and not get too down. Um, but yeah, it's yeah, definitely couldn't agree more. I guess the short and sweet of it is you still think almonds are a viable crop in parts of California? Yeah, I think almonds and other crops can be a viable part in parts of California. Maybe in some parts, chunks they really shouldn't be grown in, but I think overall it's doing a better match of our crops to what our landscape is giving us. It's hard with the economic drivers, yeah. Yeah, it definitely kills me to hear people like trash talk a nut crop, and I'm like, there's so few nuts that people eat. Why are you talking smack about like one of the few ones that people are like, actually growing and making money and feeding people with yeah it's an interesting dynamic that's going on with almonds for sure we do need a fundamental rethinking but i mean i don't i don't i think probably we should be growing a lot a lot less acres but <laughs> <laughs> we'll be forced to yeah yeah for folks that want to either read some of your research or kind of check out what you're doing do you guys or do you personally have like a social media that you use for any of this stuff or would you say like go check out google scholar or plug anything else yeah definitely so we have our the Dysis foundation website that's like dices.bio um, and you can find the papers i talked about it as well as um, papers from that have come out of the Dysis foundation you know a lot of really great papers on that you can also check out the lab I'm at, at uc davis the Amelie Gaudin's agroecology lab. So you just type in Amelie into Google, Amelie Gaudin agroecology. Um, the lab will pop up. So the website is gaudin.ucdavis.edu. Other website, uh, when I was at Cal State East Bay, um, Patio Akawa doing really cool work looking at these carbon and water fluxes at this ecosystem scale. Patty, and let's see, pull up her website. Then that's just patioikawa.weebly.com. And then I do have a, a Twitter. I think my Twitter is TomDF1. <laughs> so I, I am on, I have to look at my phone right now. I, I do tweet a little bit, <laughs> but it's not, I'm not just, I'm not, it's, let's see. It's, I just like kind of restructured it last year. What am I called? Tom, at TomDF1, Tommy Fenster. I, I will tweet some photos from the field or, if I see a paper or something, I'll try to retweet it. But, um, yeah, so those are three websites, like dices.bio, gaudin.ucdavis.edu, and then patioakawa.weebly.com. Um, some good starting points. You can go to first Google my name, Tommy Fenster, Google, Google Scholar. I, have my, I think my, my three papers <laughs> to my name so far there. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, well, this has been fantastic. I wanted to ask you about the, the grape vineyards, but I guess that might be a, a conversation for another day. We got in the weeds on the almonds, and that's okay. Yeah, well, I'll, I'll be doing a first round of field work in those uh, starting this Friday, so we'll have uh, nice. some more stories. I see you got some bottles of wine behind you. Already. Yeah, uh, my cousin works. She's the sales director for, uh, or was the sales director, rather, for... Uh, San Marzano. Okay. Uh, I think they're out there. Nice. Or maybe. I, I don't know. Yeah. I, wine's too expensive, although beer's getting to be too expensive too. So <laughs> <laughs> I do like wine more. It's just, it's, it's a tough sell when it's like you want a decent bottle and it's 25 bucks. And uh, it's like, well, I guess I got to drink this whole thing tonight. It's not like a six pack of beer. You can spread it out over a week. I know. I know. Are you trying to, are you doing any, trying to grow of um, any bit of culture yourself at all or uh, i do i've got um what do i have i got barbara diasti okay uh, i've got some nebbiolo grapes oh nice and what's the last one i've got don't remember off the top of my head i just grabbed them like on a whim a year or two ago yeah and i've got like some like not not wine making grapes just like concord and yeah the 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 standard eating type grapes yeah but those guys, I'm actually going to like trellis out and give them a proper home once I've got five minutes. Yeah, how are they doing so far? Here? I mean, it's year two. They're they're living. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. yeah I, I went for the the grapes I could find that were furthest north of Italy and were still like a wine I liked. Yeah. So they they seemed like one of some of the hardier ones because I think they're from like the Torino mm -hmm. and uh, Genoa air. Well, not Genoa, like more inland than Genoa. They still got buds on them, so like you can see that they're still alive. They yeah. haven't started coming out yet this year, but yeah. probably a few years out from actually harvesting anything. Yeah, but. definitely. I know, and I think you know, kind of talking about that hybrids. That's where something with grapes, you 
before, you know, looking at the hybrid grapes are starting to kind of, I think, I think there's some real, real potential there. And also maintaining the good, <laughs> some of those good sort of European grape flavors. Yeah. yeah. I mean, my, my dad's from Italy and like, uh, when he was a kid, they lived on like a grape vineyard and like the idea of being the first generation that didn't have a grape vineyard. Like I, I have to, I have to do it. Like yeah, it's not it, an option. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's really neat. Yeah. And it's, it's fun to kind of learn more about the yeah. system. Yeah, it's really cool. yeah. I wish my grandfather was around to like teach me more of it because like he, he was doing it every day. My dad was a kid when he came to the U S Yeah. Uh, but like he was doing that until he was like in his forties and then came here and was like a, a day laborer. Yeah. Like what a waste of talent. <laughs> and, but like you know he moved to new england he didn't know yeah. back in the 70s and it's a, there's a little bit of a i mean there's kind of the bit of culture is kind of um, it's popping up kind of all over and then probably there's a little bit of a scene in, in new england i'm guessing yeah I, where i live i'm right near the cape area and it's like super sandy yeah. low ph soil it actually really is pretty decent for um growing grapes i know down in like newport there's some a handful of wines i've never really been super impressed with the wines yeah. they make but like uh i mean it's there like you you technically can do it yeah uh so like there, there's definitely i think some opportunity and especially given climate change it, it's going to be really interesting to see i was trying to like use the the projections for like 25 years from now to see like what my climate compares to like in yeah. europe and i was like oh in 25 years it's going to be like fairly similar to like inland italy like northern italy like oh, wow. it's not terrible i can work with that yeah 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 so playing the long game <laughs> yeah playing the long game and there isn't a lot of development on the, the yeah some of the hybrids of Vitis vinifera with um you know some more usually they're getting better and better at it once they kind of eliminate that like that foxy flavor that some of these these hybrids have and i think it's like you know i know it's just out of davis it is you know to kind of help adapt with these these drought adaptions and crossing them in with some uh California natives, I think Gurdiana, um, that's what they are. Oh no, it's Vitis, Vitis Arizona. And uh, yeah, it's like, you know, it's 98%, you know, they, they cross it and back cross it in Vitis. And it's like yeah. 98% that it's been a fair, but it just has that, you know, enough for some of this disease resistance that we're dealing with as well as more drought tolerance. I think there's yeah. a lot of you know, potential there as well, too, to get that nice Vitis and also a little more regionally adapted as well. Yeah, that's, it's one of those things, like, I think, you know, you always look back when, if you were younger, like, what you would do differently, but I think growing up in New England, where, like, the idea, like, oh, you can do this for, like, work on a wine vineyard for a living yeah. was so disconnected from the world I grew up in, yeah. like, if my grandfather had gone to Italy, uh, gone to, like, California instead of New England, I would 100% today probably be working on a vineyard. Yeah. Like, that. that's where I'm, like, happiest, is, like, working with the grapes. So, it's just, it's funny how things work out. We gotta, um, yeah, if you come out to California, be, be sure to, you know, let me know, give me a call or an email and we'll, uh, yeah, get you out to some, uh, get you out to some vineyards or, or something like that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I got, f my uncle, uh, moved out there a couple of years ago. He works for Disney. He's an engineer. Okay. He keeps telling me I need to go out and I just like, maybe when COVID's over someday I'll make it out there. <laughs> yeah, I know. Oh man. Yeah, I know. It's, yeah, it's just hard to find time to travel or or whatnot or anything at all like that yeah oh man but uh yeah tom this was uh tommy this was great um so i'd never hit stop recording but we're we were done pretty much when i started talking yeah. about the wine yeah, yeah, <laughs> i'll yeah, hit yeah, that yeah. now i guess <laughs>